Welcome to the Doctor in Educational Leadership. We're so glad to have uh, Dr. Sarah uh, Ryan with us. We um, have something in common. We both worked at the Education Development Center in Watertown. Um, a really great experience out there. It's a research um, think tank that contains a lot of different really interesting projects. Dr. Ryan's work focuses on uh, English language learners and other uh, bilingual uh, <coughs> students and how different policies impact uh, their lives. Um, and so we're just so glad that you came from the frozen tundra <laughs> of Wisconsin, is what she was telling I did, but I've, you got the right colors here, green and gold. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And we, uh, I grew up in Michigan, so I okay. in Winter Big Ten School, so I totally get the cold part. Yep. But we're so glad you're here and you're visiting with us. We really look forward to your talk. Thank you to everyone that's watching us live on social media and in perpetuity on, on those uh, channels. So without further ado, Dr. Sarah Wright. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you uh, this evening, and especially thrilled to be back in California. I did my, my graduate work here in California, actually, with Dr. Romero, um, but I've been away for quite some years, and it was 12 degrees when I left Madison yesterday, so this feels quite summerly to me. <laughs> So I am Sarah Ryan, and I am a research scientist at the Wisconsin <coughs> Center for Education Research, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and also the Director of Research Policy and Evaluation for the WIDA Consortium, which I'll also talk about in a few minutes. So where are we going in the next 60 minutes? I'm going to start just to talking a little bit about the Wisconsin Center for Ed Research and WIDA, where mm -hmm. I hail from. And then get into the, the topic for this evening, the long-term, or as I refer to it, the so-called long-term English learner population. What do we know? What do we not know? And what did we ask in this research? I'll tell you three things to remember, just in case you start to, your mind starts to drift. I know it's Friday evening. Um, methods, results, implications, and leave some time for questions and discussion. So, sort of a nesting going on here. So. I'm actually, my, my center is part of the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Education. We're in Madison, Wisconsin, part of the, the UW. And the Wisconsin Center for Education Research is one of the longest standing, um, really most well-known education research centers in the country, if not the world. Um, and WIDA is a project within the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. So you can see we have a, <laughs> the WIDA is about, probably about 160 people, so we are a quite large project, um, particularly to be housed in a, in a university-based uh, education research center. So what is WIDA? Well, we are actually a state-based consortium. So in 2001, the No Child Left Behind legislation was passed, and shortly after that, the federal government, the Federal Department of Education, basically said that the English language proficiency assessments that were being used in schools at that time were really not doing a very good job of assessing the English language that students needed to be able to engage with content as, um, as reflected in new standards and the sort of the standards-based accountability movement, and particularly the Common Core State Standards. And so they put out what was called an enhanced assessment grant for consortium of states to come together to develop new and better assessments that really captured not only students' social language, but also their capabilities with the kind of language that they needed to access grade-level rigorous content and curricula. At that time, three states came together. Um, our director, Tim Bowles, wrote that grant with several other individuals, and people around WIDA joke that it's sort of a grant that went viral. Um, we are now a consortia of 40 states and U.S. territories. Um, our most recent member includes all of the Department of Defense schools around the world. So we offer, of course, the assessment, which is that Access for English Language Learners Assessment. California is not a WIDA state, so California has the ALPAC assessment, previously the SELT assessment, and you can see some of the so some of the big players in terms of just overall EL population, Texas, Arizona, California, New York, um, they still develop their own English language proficiency assessment, and then there's another small consortia called ELPA that, that includes most of the rest of states. So we develop the assessment, do all the validation, um, work with states, do the administration, um, 
We do development research, which is really related to um, research that improves the resources we offer, the standards, the professional learning, all state-based consortium member um, then get access to professional learning around educating multilingual learners. Um, and then this piece, research, which is really where my department comes into play. So we really are more of an externally facing research group when we think about the consortia. So we work with our consortium members, largely state policymakers, um, around their research needs. So we co-construct a research agenda, um, and then we work with them to carry out sort of research that really responds to needs of policy and practice. And we are growing in size and, and moving more into um, really trying to straddle that line of policy and practice relevant research, but also research that informs the field. I think that we often fall into the trap of thinking about research as having to be one or the other, as having to be applied or be research that you see in journals. And my team is really focused on how do we do both, because I think both are possible. So moving to the topic of this evening, long-term English learners, and making that connection to the consortium, um, about a year and a half ago, we have, a, we have a research subcommittee as part of the consortium structure, and that's made up of about 15 SEA policymakers, most of them in research and accountability offices or English language uh, assessment and development offices who are part of the research subcommittee. And as I mentioned, we work with them to sort of develop a research agenda to think about what, what issues and challenges are in their minds and on the minds of practitioners in the state on how do we think about research that can kind of help to move our understanding of those challenges forward and hopefully move to sort of thinking about strategies to address some of those challenges. And the challenge that really rose to the top was around this long-term English learner population. And that's been defined in a few different ways across both research and policy. So in the studies that exist, it tends to be time-based, right? So English learners who have been classified as such for anywhere from five to seven years, depending on the state and the definition, without meeting criteria for reclassification as fully English proficient. That matters because we know that reclassification is a major milestone for English learners. Often it can mean the difference between, particularly as they reach middle school and high school, having full access to the full range of curricula, including things like advanced placement courses and college preparatory coursework. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it can be a, a gatekeeper, particularly as students reach those, reach those middle and high school years. I think another reason why this population really rose to the um, sort of the top of the list for our, our, our consortium stakeholders is that the, the Every Student Succeeds Act legislation really places a spotlight on this student group. So as of 2015, with the ESSA legislation, states and districts are now required to report the number of ELs since initial identification who continue to be classified as ELs for five years or more. <clears throat> so now this group has some accountability weight as well. And yet, we know relatively no, little about this group. The research that does exist has come from a relatively small number of states and districts. And I'm gonna apologize. <coughs> I am no longer contagious, but I'm recovering from a cold. So as you could probably hear in my voice, um, so I'm going to pause here as needed to hopefully avoid uh, a, a coughing fit here. So some of the initial research, actually some of it done here in California, suggested that as many as a quarter to half of all English learners would eventually become long-term English learners, meaning that they would not be reclassified even after five, six, seven or more years. And so you've probably heard, those of you who work in schools, or witness yourself these stories of English learners who have been in the U.S. educational system their entire educational careers and leave high school never having been reclassified. So that's kind of the prototypical um, long-term English learner that, that many people think of when they think about this population. The students often in early re research were described as transient. They moved around a lot and they struggled in both their native language and the English language and in academics. <coughs> More recently, I would say, so that research kind of comes from the late 2000s. More recent research over the last, say, five years has sort of pushed back, pushed back on this relatively deficit-oriented view. And some of this more recent research has also drawn attention to the role that policy plays in actually constructing this group. 
So for example, it matters where a state set their reclassification criterion in terms of who might fall into or out of this group across states. And some of this more recent research also really draws attention to examples of how students who are labeled as long-term English learners are actually succeeding. But what are the things that we don't know? Well, as I mentioned, a lot of this research has come from a small number of states, tending to be states with pretty high concentrations of English learners. So California, Texas, Arizona, New York. Though we know relatively little about the dynamics of this population across a broader cross-section of the country. And that's where our research comes in. So we asked, really, how does the size of this population vary both within and across states? And what do we know, what can we learn about some of the characteristics of this potential long-term English learner population across states? And I'll talk in a few minutes about why I use that term potential. <coughs> so as I said, just in case your mind wanders, <coughs> if nothing else, remember this. Three things. Rates of so-called long-term English learners <coughs> are actually very wide, pretty widely across states, and even more so within states, across districts. We really need to be talking more about how to support mobile ELs, particularly ELs who are moving across district and state boundaries. And finally, our inability to better distinguish between disability and language-related needs has implications for students, and it also has implications for accountability metrics. And I want to say a little something about why I'm using some of this tentative language, so-called long-term English learners. Um, when we embarked on this topic with our consortium members, <coughs> one of the things that they were actually quite thoughtful about was the terminology we use to talk about students and the fact that that's not neutral, that it has implications for students. So often, labels that we create for student subgroups come from a place of good intention, right? We're trying to draw attention to the needs of a particular student group and hopefully garner resources that are going to support greater equity and better outcomes for those students. But we also know, working in the field of education, that labels often come with drawbacks for students as well. Particularly when they sort of um, come to construct an orientation that's relatively deficit-oriented and focused on what students lack, rather than the assets that they bring. And so that was something some of our policymakers, as part of the research subcommittee brought up, was this concern about the terminology of long-term English learner. And so in the report, that we wrote based on, based on this research, we actually have a section of the report where we just grapple with that, right? That the, the, the language we use to talk about students is actually quite broad, and we don't necessarily offer any great solutions, but we try to acknowledge that we're aware of the issue and that we're trying to be really precise and careful in the language that we do use to talk about students. So the study population includes all students across 15 states who were initially identified as an English learner while in grades K-2 in the 2009-10 school year. So one of the um, assets that we have at the center that I work for is that we house a population level data set from all of these 40 states and territories that includes all English learners, <coughs> the full population, who take the access for ELL's assessment for as long as they take that assessment. So for the 15 states that we look at in this research, we have longitudinally connected individual level data that goes back to 2009-10. Uh, and so the sample, or it's actually not a sample, it is the full census of students that we're looking at in this research is actually about 167,000 students. And we follow those students through 2014-15. So you can see here data, population level data, we have district and school identifiers with the data that allows us to link to other federal uh, data sets, including the Common Core of data, the School and Staffing Survey, and most recently the Stanford Education Data Archive. And we have their, all of their English language proficiency assessment data, as well as <coughs> student demographic characteristics. And the method we use in this research is descriptive. Um, 
And I think it's worth pointing out, there's actually a great paper that came out. It was published by the Institute of Education Sciences in 2017. Susanna Loeb is the first author, and John Reardon is a co-author, Pamela Morris. <coughs> And the paper talks about the importance of rigorous descriptive research, which we've lost a little bit of sight of, I think, in the last decade in education. <coughs> we've been pretty, you know, pretty enamored with um, the precision of causal research. And sometimes descriptive research gets relegated to a section of a paper or the stepping stone to the real thing that we're trying to get to. But particularly with large and complex data sets, Descriptive research can be really valuable and sometimes even more valuable and powerful for impacting policy, right? It's, it's often easier to, um, to tell a story. Um, and sometimes when we get into more uh, sophisticated methods and we start controlling for all kinds of things, when it comes to policy and practice, that can start to lose some of its meaning because as we know, on the ground in practice, we can't actually control for things like student language and student socioeconomic background. So, you know, as you all think about your, your work, um, I think it's important to sort of keep that in mind, that good descriptive research is actually quite important in our field. So the key measure we use is the access for ELLs assessment. And this is the summative, as I said, English language proficiency assessment. It's taken by about 2 million English learners in, in kindergarten through 12th grade across 40 states and territories every year. Students are assessed in reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and those four domain scores are used to create a composite proficiency level. You have something similar here in California, right? It's, it's a scale. Um, students have a composite proficiency level score, and in many states, that CPL score is the primary criterion used for reclassification. Not necessarily the only criterion, so states may also look at other things. <coughs> Districts may also look at other things. but it's often that composite proficiency level score that is a key indicator used to make those decisions about reclassification. So in states across the consortium, most of the states, including the states that we look at in this research, set that criterion for reclassification somewhere between about a 4.5 and a 5.5. So I want to take a little bit of time to just deconstruct this uh, figure here because this is the process that we use to identify the potential long-term English learner students across states, which is actually not necessarily easy to do at first blush because states set their own reclassification criteria. So they decide at what composite proficiency level students will, students will be reclassified, reclassified as English proficient. So if we want to sort of look at this population across states, we have to determine some way to sort of compare apples to apples. And so the, this is really the way that we did that. So we looked at the 2009-10 access test administration and asked first, is this the first time the student is taking the, the assessment while in grades K through two? If no, they're excluded. If yes, we move on and we look six years later in 2014-15. Do they have any own composite score and 2014-15, or is it missing? If it's not missing and they have a score, we come over here and we go, okay, do they report a composite proficiency level score in 14-15 that is above 4.5? If yes, we're classifying them as potentially proficient, and if no, we're reclassifying them as potentially long-term EL. So why 4.5? In the 15 states we look at, as I said, they ranged in their composite proficiency level reclassification criteria, but 4.5 was the minimum used across those 15 states. So basically we're saying, if after six years, the English learner hasn't re re uh, reached sort of a, uh, a kind of a minimum threshold for considering them English proficient, then we're gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna classify them as part of this potential long-term English learner group. If they have, we're gonna classify them as part of this potentially proficient group. What happens if they're missing? If we look at 2014-15 and we don't see a score observed? Well, then we start looking back in the data and we look at whether or not the student ever received a 4.5 at some point prior to 2014-15. And if they did, then they go into this group, the potentially proficient group. <clears throat> if they did not, we classify them as dropped 
from our, the population we're looking at. Who largely falls into this group? This is largely students who are mobile across state or national boundaries. So in our data, if students are moving around within states, we can follow them, right? We track on up to 15 different individual student identifiers. But if they move across state lines or out of the country, we're not able to track them, which is the case um, in, in, in most data sets that it is hard to follow students across, across state lines. So how does that break down in the data? Well, let me pause. Any questions? Is this making sense? It's important to understand who's in each of these groups, so if you forget, I can come back to it. So for that K-2 cohort <coughs> of English learners, <coughs> again, about 167,000 students, in 2014-15, about 13% of those students fall into that potential long-term English learner group. So this is quite a bit lower than some estimates would suggest. So that early research from California suggested anywhere from a quarter to a half of all else. So we think, okay, well, 13%. That's quite a bit lower, actually. And I think it's important to note that we've got like a real story of success going on here, right? 65% of those students that we are able to track reached that sort of potential proficient mark after six years. And I point that out, again, just going to this, back to this point of, we often focus, I think when we think about English learners or students with disabilities or many of the subgroups we, we tend to classify in education, we tend to focus on what students can't do and where things are going wrong. It's equally important to think about where things are going right and what we are doing right as a system for students. So I think this is an important success story. And then 22% of that cohort that we track is dropped from the sample, right? So this is the mobile group. And that, that number is pretty consistent with what we know about EL mobility. Um, on average, for the general student population, U.S. Census estimates suggest that about 2% of students are mobile across state or national boundaries each year. But for English learners, that's about 7%. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the fact that we're looking across six years, this is actually maybe somewhat lower than we'd expect, although this is an average across the 15 states. <clears throat> but when I say, well, this 13% seems fairly low relative to some of the estimates we know from some of that early research, what it doesn't account for is what's going on with these kids and that we don't know. Some of them are here, some of them are here. What exactly that mix is, we can't know because we couldn't track them. But I'll talk a little bit about, we can sort of make some assumptions and, and see how that impacts the findings. So this is just across, across all 15 of the states, but what happens when we look state by state? <clears throat> so let me break this down. So on the y-axis over here, you have the percent of the student cohort broken down by these 15 states. And we don't name the states, that's, that's an agreement with the states who are part of the consortium. We're going to check there, um, sort of maintain the confidentiality of the data. Along the x-axis, these are the states <coughs> grouped by their composite proficiency level required for reclassification. So the four states that are following in the low range, they had a composite proficiency level for reclassification between 4.5 and 4.9. In the medium group, their CPL criterion for reclassification was between 5.0 and 5.5. And then we had one state that required a CPL above 5.5. What's striking is the variability across states. So we have a potential long-term English learner rate ranging anywhere from 2% in state nine to 24% in state 15, and everywhere in between. And even when we look at states with similar reclassification criteria, just in this group alone, these rates range anywhere from two to 18%. So you could think, well, wouldn't we, th maybe states with similar reclassification criteria, 
the, the, those long-term English learner rates should look more similar. And we don't necessarily see that. We actually see, as well, quite a bit of variability across states in that mobile student population, right? And we know that some of these states, for example, are on the northeastern border, where there tends to be more back and forth between either Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic. So there tends to be more transnational movement there. So that raises questions about, well, if we knew what was happening to these students in this dropped subgroup, how might that change our <coughs> estimates of both the long term English learner population and that potentially proficient population? And again, I do want to point out here that I don't want to lose sight of the story of success. That when we look across these states, we actually have a lot of English learners who are reclassifying, who are meeting that criteria within six years, right? That says something important about those students and also about our school systems. So if we make some assumptions about this drop subgroup, how might it change these estimates? Well, one thing we could do is we could say, well, let's just assume that all of these students become long-term English learners. What does that do to our sort of estimate of the size of this population across states? And here's what that looks like. So we still see quite a bit of variability across states. But obviously, as we would expect, those proportions are higher. And now they range anywhere from 24 to 46%. So almost exactly what those estimates from early research suggested, quarter to a half of all EOs. But it's unlikely that all of our students who are moving around across state and national boundaries are bound to become long-term English learners. That seems to be kind of a, an inaccurate assumption. So what if we instead say, well, we know students who are mobile, right? Whether they're English learners or not, students who are more mobile tend to struggle, right? It tends to be harder to just get up to speed when you're moving around a lot. So let's say maybe two-thirds of that dropped subgroup become long-term English learners, and the other third actually moves into that potentially proficient subgroup. And now here's what those numbers look like, right? So you've got about three-quarters of students across states who are reaching that bar for proficiency, that kind of minimum bar within six years. And then you've got about 18 to 35 percent of students across states who would fall into that potentially long-term English learner subgroup. So it's not a negligible subset of the English learner population, but maybe not quite as large of a subset as some of that early research has led us to suggest. And I think that's important because, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> federal legislation has sort of cemented the significance of this label. Um, and so it's important to think about, like, what students are we talking about? And what does that population look like across states? What does this mobility mean? Right? So in the federal legislation, it says that states should be tracking students across state boundaries so that they can accurately report their long-term English learner population. I think most of you sitting in the room, if you work in K-12 education systems, know how hard it is for schools and states to track students across state boundaries. And so there's sort of this, this mismatch here, which probably is leading to sort of higher estimates of long-term English learner populations and higher reporting by some states who might be receiving a lot of students moving in and lower estimates or lower reporting in other states. So it has accountability implications. So if we switch gears a little bit and just look a little bit, and here we're moving back to, rather than by state, just looking on the average across the states, some of the characteristics of these three groups. So here you see, this is by home language background. So in our data, not surprisingly, about 70% of the students are from a Spanish-speaking background. And then you can see, we actually have, English is actually the top home language among the top five home language across the WIDA consortium states. <clears throat> so this tends to be, it's based on how, student, how parents fill out that home language survey. Many of those students are American Indian students, um, and then Arabic, other Asian, and not specified. <clears throat> One thing worth pointing out here is that some research has suggested that long-term English learners are much higher in the Spanish-speaking population than in other language background groups. Based on these data, we don't necessarily see that. Particularly striking, and this is something I mentioned, uh, sort of those three things to remember, <coughs> has to do with that disability status. 
So in our data, 10% of that 167,000 students had an IEP at some point over the course of the study we looked at. 45% of those students fell into the potential <coughs> long-term English learner subgroup. Almost half. If we look at students who never had an IEP during that period, only 10% of those students <coughs> were classified as a potential long-term English learner. So clearly, there's a pretty significant overlap here. And this goes back to the point I made earlier about how we continue to struggle. And I think as a research community, we continue to struggle to help practitioners better distinguish between disability-related needs and language development-related needs. What that can ultimately mean for students is that they get, as some people have put it, sort of trapped within that English learner designation, even though their needs and the, the, the challenge that they're facing in reclassifying really has to do with disability-related needs. And what are the implications of that now that districts and states must report on long-term English learner numbers to the federal government? And then finally, this demonstrates the variability we actually see within the states in that long-term English learner population. Okay, and so that's much, actually much greater than we see across states, which isn't actually surprising given we know about sort of how variability sits among students, among schools, among districts, among states. And I think it's striking to see here visually. <clears throat> so what you see here across these 15 states are just your sort of standard basket plots and whisker plot. What's interesting is that, like on this, in state 15, you get your sort of typical, here's the median, this bar in the middle of the box, your first and third quartile. Up here we have our outliers, right? So they're falling, they're, those proportions are extremely high. In many states they have a few outliers who are like 100%. But in a lot of the states, you don't get this median in the middle, and that's because the median is actually zero, right? So in a lot of states, the median long-term English learner population is actually zero. Um, but then you've got these outliers that are really pulling that mean up. And a lot of these outlier districts tend to be small rural districts. So they're districts that maybe only have a few English learners, but all of their English learners are falling into that potential long-term English learner subgroup. So what does that sort of suggest to us, for example, about policy implementation? So states set reclassification policy, but we know from sort of a spate of recent studies that there is quite a bit of variability across districts within states in how those policies get implemented. And I think that's some of what we're seeing here. So ultimately, we conclude with sort of a few major takeaways, right? That long-term English learner population, or that potential LTEL population, varies quite markedly across states and even more so within states. <clears throat> So what is the role of state reclassification policy and district implementation of this policy in potentially constructing that long-term English learner population? This is a question that um, scholar, uh, I believe at uh, UT San Antonio, her name is uh, Monica Brooks, has done a lot of really great writing about this very question. We sort of have situated this long-term English learner ness often within students without really interrogating the role that policy plays in constructing this group. EL mobility rates, that dropped EL subgroup, <clears throat> far outpace rates for the overall state student population. We know that to be true. <clears throat> what is the relationship between student mobility and LTEL identification? And what are the implications of that, right? So a lot of the intervention work, if you will, in terms of supporting long-term English learners thus far has really been focused on waiting until students are identified as well tells and then trying to provide sort of intervention courses, say, at the high school level. Well, if it's actually the case that student mobility is playing a pretty large role, what does that mean for practice? How do schools support those learners who are moving around more? And then finally, this issue of the overlap between LTEL identification and disability status. How can in states and districts ensure provision of appropriate effective language support services for all ELs, including ELs with disabilities? And myself as a researcher, I ask myself for sort of what are the obligations that I have to try and help states and districts do that better? <clears throat> 
In terms of where we're heading next, I'm not going to read this all to you. Um, as I said, we work with a research subcommittee, and so in the next phase of this research, <clears throat> we're actually partnering with three states to get individual level um, longitudinal data from states. They have a more robust set of individual demographic characteristics, um, including sort of student poverty background, to really probe deeper into the variation we see both within states and across states in the size and characteristics of this population. And then there'll be a second phase of that research that looks more closely at individual language development trajectories. So we sort of constructed, this, it is sort of accepted now to be fact that there's something magical, say, about five, six, or seven years that all of a sudden a student moves from being an English learner to a long-term English learner. But that's sort of an arbitrary hallmark. I think it really comes from research that was conducted almost 20 years ago now by Kenji Okuda and some colleagues that suggested this five to seven year window. That research was conducted before the Common Core State Standards, before we're asking students to do a lot of new and different things with language. So the extent to which that's still an accurate time frame, to me, is a little bit unclear. And it's also an average, suggesting that some students are going to need less time and some students are going to need more time. So we sort of arbitrarily said that there's this kind of time point set up, and, and after that we move students into this, this label, which has implications, both good and bad for them. <clears throat> and so what we'd like to do is to use a particular methodological strategy to really understand what the data tell us, what are subgroups of language development trajectories. So for example, we could have some students who continue, say, for three or four years, they're making pretty steady language development progress, and then they plateau. We could have another group of students that consistently makes progress year after year, but it's just slower. It's just a little bit on a slower trajectory than that five to seven year time frame. And what we might do to support those two different groups of students is actually different. That matters. Um, and by just sort of looking at this crude, like, time point cutoff, that doesn't actually tell us that much about what students need. So there, I'm going to pause I, or stop. I do want to acknowledge, so one of my colleagues, Nurek Sahakyan, an amazing researcher, has worked with our data set for almost a decade, was a, one of the main contributors on this research. So I really want to acknowledge his efforts, as well as the contributions of the WIDA Research Subcommittee. And just to thank you for your time, there is a report and brief available on the research. You can find them. Um, we've revised our website at WIDA, and actually, things are very difficult to find there. <laughs> so the link is here, and I can certainly share these slides, or you can actually just find it by like Googling LTEL WIDA. Um, so at that point, I will stop. Um, I seem to have gotten, gotten through my uh, coughing fit. I knew it was going to happen. Um, and I'm happy to take questions or hopefully just maybe have a bit of a discussion. <coughs> Question, yes? Um, maybe you mentioned it, I apologize for my tardiness, but maybe you uh, mentioned when it comes to those uh, ELs that are considered traveling or, or, or I saw dropped as part of the uh, mm -hmm. term used, does that account for also potentially uh, students who, for whatever reason, may not be part of the, you know, the, the education system, if you will, whether, whether they uh, went back to their, to, to their tribal land or, or if it's a situation where, for whatever reason, they're no, no longer in the system. Is that also included in that number? Yeah, okay. so that, that drop subgroup would be students who are either moving across state boundaries or who are transnationally mobile. So they might be going back to their, their, um, their country of birth or country of parents' birth for some time. And what tends to happen, I think, in schools is even if students are moving back and forth, is that they might come back, mm -hmm. but they might not, have, like, say they get assigned a new student identifier number when right. they come back, you know? So right. they, they or, get or for them, I know that the grades they, that, that you used were, were K through 2, I think, were the first testing point, and then six years later. I mean, I don't know that it's impossible that even some of those kids may have dropped out of school, if you will. Maybe they didn't travel just, but for whatever reason, they're no longer, no longer going to school. Yeah. That would also be in that number two. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And you bring up a good point. So we looked at students who were in K-2 in 2009-10, and we made that decision for a reason, because I think we would see something different, and I think it's important to acknowledge this difference. If we had started with students, say, who were in grades 4 through 6 in 2009-10, um, 
coming in as new English learners in grades four through six. We, I think we would potentially see even higher rates in that long-term English learner population because we know that for English learners who come in the later they come in, it can be just, it's just harder um, to kind of do that catching up as, as they're learning the language. Yeah? How do you deal with um, fuzziness in the data? So one day my daughter came home an English language learner and my, um, my wife said, our daughter does not speak English. And I said, we both live in the same house, right? Like, she speaks English, but the charter school that she was going to had decided that she was an English language learner. Uh -huh. So there's some school finance motivations in the states that have weighted funding formulas yeah. to determine these. There's also differentials in district policy. When I was in Houston, um, when I worked for Houston School District, there were schools that would never reclassify anybody. Because yep. they just they didn't have the bandwidth, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the information, right? Um, so how do you deal with like all those things that have been well documented in the literature by Guadalupe and, yep. and lots of other books? How do, you, how do you deal with that question? Well, it's a good point. And I, let me see it. Let me try and answer and see if I'm answering your question. Um, so this is a, a, you know, the further you move from what's happening on the ground at the local level, the more you're sort of painting an overall picture but you're missing a lot of important detail, right? So this research really says, if we look across these 15 states, if we sort of take the data as, you know, we're including students for whom we can track in our data set, we know they're taking the access for ELLs assessment year after year, what does this global picture look like? But I think in that, you know, when we look at sort of the, the variability that's happening across states and within states, this starts to get closer to what you're talking about, right? So like if you look at this state, this was the state that had 2% long-term English learner. Like what is going on here? Like you got just like, you got like a bunch of them around zero and then a ton of outliers. Like we've even, we've actually had a conversation with that state. Like what's going on in state policy? Like a rate of 2% seems like really low. Um, so is there something that's either um, codified in policy or is sort of an unspoken policy that suggests that we're getting them out? Like it doesn't matter, right? We're getting them out. Um, so that's where we hope to go in sort of the next phase of research is starting to get closer to what's happening at the local, like the, the district level, um, sort of looking closer within these three states um, through more, first through quantitative research and then hopefully identifying sites that we can do some more qualitative research in. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I think what you're saying is that when it comes to identifying and reclassifying English learners, there's sort of the policy that's on paper, and then there's what can happen in practice, and there's actually quite a bit of variability in how students get identified and reclassified, even within states that have on paper the same policy. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we actually, it's actually 45%. I know these numbers get a little bit. So in the overall sample, we have 167,000 students. 10% of those ever had an IEP. But among that 10% that ever had an individualized education plan, 45%, almost half of those students, fall into that potential long-term English learner subgroup. And I think this point you bring up is just, um, I mean, I, I, I taught ESL and bilingual education early in my career, and it was, it was, this was almost 20 years ago now, and it's, it's an issue we continue to grapple with, is how do you disentangle those needs? And I don't think we, we have great ways of doing that, actually. We're still struggling with it. And so I, I think just anecdotally from my experience working with educators and state policymakers is that what tends to happen or what can tend to happen is you know, sort of educators don't want to deny a student a service that they 
are entitled to. And so they say, well, we'll, we'll just we'll just keep both labels, right? We'll, we'll just keep them classified as an English learner, even though for a lot of English learners with disabilities, in practice, what does tend to happen is that sort of the special ed team and the ESL bilingual team and the general classroom teachers sort of decide where are their, where are their most significant needs best being met. So what happens for a lot of English learners with disabilities is they're actually not receiving ESL or bilingual education services they're being served in the general classroom or in the special education department, but they're still retaining that label. Um, but, but that has implications then because they, they fall into that long-term English learner group and now states and districts have to report that group when it's, you know, sort of, should they be? Should we be re sort, of, sort of retaining that label if it really is a need that's more related to the disability than, than English language development? That's a, that is a, you should take that on as a dissertation topic. <laughs> I mean, to that, um, struggling or not, are there, are there academics or, or are there theoretical approaches that, have, that are already being developed or applied? Or is, is, what's out there so far, you know, whether it's working or not is a different story, but, it, you know, are there any names that pop in your mind as far as people that are looking at this issue? at the overlap between disability status Absolutely, and, yes. and long-term English learner status, or, or English or learner status. status period. Yep. Um, Tat, I think it's Tatiana Klein actually had a paper come out, her, her last name is K-L-E-Y-N, that's come out relatively recently, um, looking at the importance of collaboration between special education staff and English language development staff. Um, as that being really like a potentially strong leverage point for surveying students who are dual identified well. Um, long time people in this field, um, Kathy Escamilla, um, Leonard Baca, who's since retired, who are both the, were at CU Boulder, um, have done a lot of work in this field. Um, so a couple people whose names are escaping me right now, but I can picture their look. Um, so it's, def it's, a field, you know, it's a field of research um, that's been going on for some decades. There's a lot of really robust qualitative research that's been done in this area. Thank you very much. Yeah. I know you said this is pretty high level and eventually you'll get down to more practical level, but you also said you taught EL for a while. So like, is there anything that you can see like student service-wise that can, can get some of these people back on track sooner? or yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think what some places are doing are trying to, I don't know if you're familiar with, this has been particularly prevalent in like the college preparation literature of sort of these early warning or indicator systems. So trying to develop like, what are signals that we can use to see where, where English learners might, might be like not on track. Like, where can we sort of identify like, okay, they're not, they're not progressing. They've kind, of, they've kind of hit a plateau in their English language proficiency. Um, so I think that there's been some progress in starting to try and identify, okay, when might this be happening? I think the struggle continues to be, and I don't think this is specific to long-term English learners, but I think you know, English learners gen generally is ensuring that they get appropriate services. Right? I think that um, for a lot of the challenges we face with English learners, a lot of those challenges come back to ensuring that those students are actually receiving appropriate instruction. Um, and so I think what can happen for a lot of students is that, um, I don't know if this is as prevalent as in schools as it, it was when I was teaching, but um, the, the needs of the English learners or the accountability for those students' progress could sometimes get sort of relegated to like the English as a second language teacher or the bilingual curriculum specialist. Um, when we know that a lot of our English learners are actually spending the majority of their school day in the general classroom setting. And so I know states like California, states like Massachusetts have tried to think about some of this in their teacher certification programs. Like how are we ensuring that educators have the tools that they need no matter if they're a general classroom teacher or an ESL teacher or a special education teacher, to be meeting the language development needs of these students. But I think we still have a long way to go there. And so I think that that's, that's 
that's actually a critical piece, right? Is 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 just actually making sure that students are getting really high quality evidence based strategies for supporting language development as well as access to grade level content at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, um, as an administrator, one of the hardest um, pieces of it, well, that I find when it comes to our long term English learners and um, even beginning the process of uh, special education testing is that hesitation of should we do it, should we not, right? And um, it's like that scary gray field where yeah. you don't want to assess um, just for the sake of assessing. Yeah. Um, do you know of any current research that might help administrators um, begin to have that, bring the pieces together so that we're feeling a little bit more confident on if and when we should be doing that? There is, there is research on, on um, I think that there's been a fair amount of research on like sort of multi-tiered systems of support or response to intervention specific to English language learners. So really thinking about um, my last two years um, in schools was in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I worked with a team. We worked with all 50 schools in the district. So when a, an English learner was being referred to like that school study team, or you know, schools call it different things, but it's sort of the guidance counselor and the special ed, and the ESO, you know, the, the general education classroom teacher, and they come together and they say, "Wow, we're seeing challenges with this student. They're struggling. What do we do? Should we assess?" And so I would actually come to those meetings, and our team would work with the school-based team to try. So, example, we'd start by trying some um, working with the teacher to try, like, for three weeks, let's try this, right? Um, to try and figure out, um, let's try if they see if they responded to this, this small intervention, which might suggest that it really is about English language development and not so much about, say, a language-related disability, because we're seeing some response to this, versus, wow, we're really not seeing a response, and so maybe that's one more piece of evidence that suggests that we really maybe do need to think about testing. When it would move to assessment, I think it then really becomes critical to think about, so for example, we always included uh, 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 usually like a 60 to 90 minute interview with the family. Um, and I would actually go to the family's home. Um, and you would learn all kinds of things about, like I remember one student in particular who had, the family had moved from Mexico and for the first five years of his life, they lived in a home where the, the, the floor was sort of packed dirt and there was lead in the soil. And so it ultimately was the case that the child had had lead poisoning. Right? And had we not done that, that intensive interview with the family because they know their children best, we would have totally missed that piece. And so really understanding all those facets of the child's development and life, and then making sure that the assessment, when it moves to assessment, the different aspects of the assessment are being done in an appropriate language, right? So really thinking about where's the child's language strength. So it's really, it's not like one thing, but it's over the entire spectrum of that process like really thinking about how to be culturally and linguistically responsive. And I think if you look, like if you search like Google Scholar or Google generally, just like RTI, MTSS, English language learners, there are a lot of great resources out there, I think designed for educators to really think about how to navigate that process in ways that do take into account the student's cultural and linguistic background. Yeah? Uh, the first was that Dr. Marin and I actually did a really interesting paper maybe two years ago now about how the LCAPs do and do not address English learners, so just a quick uh, shout out to that. Um, the inside, is that for districts or schools? This is individuals. So we had 166,000, almost 167,000 individual students. Yep. Other thing is that we know a lot about, for example, special ed and charter schools. I think it'd be really interesting to see these numbers disaggregated also by charter schools. By school type? Yeah, it'd be super interesting. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. And I think we could actually do that. I think what, because of the school identifiers we have in the data. So I'm going to write that down, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, the focus on the 65% uh, the proficient English language learners, I think that was an important aspect of, of what you found because uh, like you said we can get bogged down in terms of what we're not working on apparently there's there's you know there's a good uh, there's success stories if you will within that 65 uh, percent uh, proficient 
do we know? Do we have? I know for the most part you kind of paint a picture of what, right? But yep. Why? I think a lot of us are probably asking that question. What's behind? Yeah. These numbers, particularly this, this 65 really stands out. Do we have? Can we hypothesize if anything in terms of what's working? Yeah. With the successes. Well, I doubt it's any one thing. <laughs> And, and um, I'm looking at Susie here because um, I'm sure she has uh, great things to say about just what she knows about what's happening in California. For example, the role of leadership, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the student services. <laughs> There's actually a great paper that just came out. Um, the first off, it's Madeline Montevideo <laughs> and Rachel White. And they look at the role of school leaders in EL policy implementation and the critical role that school leaders play in implementing EL-specific policy in a way that promotes social justice. So I think leader, like leadership, climate, quality teaching, the language instruction educational program, what is the programming being used, and sort of what is that based on. Um, so I think we know of things, right? Um, oh, we have more to learn. That's a, that's a great researcher cop out, isn't it? <laughs> Um, also, uh, you know, recommend Gerardo Lopez, who visited here, uh, Erica Byrne Jimenez, uh, who's now the executive, who, who is um, on the executive committee of uh, UCA, I think. Um, so I think um, we just so appreciated having you here. Yeah. Uh, super interesting work. Uh, EL, some of the work I do, um, um, yeah. some of my ancillary work. Uh, so just thanks so much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much.